Mr. Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, do any of you know how much training the drone operators receive in international law and these sort of issues? I quote Bill Banks as saying none. I think, yes. I think uh, Professor O'Connell is referring to a conversation we had about the, uh, the known training of, of CIA personnel in that regard. And that's true, although I've read recently that, that there may be some, but I have no inside information. Of course, members of the military, perhaps Professor Glazier should comment on the law of war training. Well, I can't speak at all to, to what the CIA um, folks are getting. Um, but I'd also note that in, in the you know, it sounds sort of an odd thing to say, perhaps, um, but the reality is that the U.S. military has always sort of emphasized law of war compliance uh, among the practitioners sort of in the form of giving them sort of clear rules to follow. So the reality is that there are many situations which American service personnel may not even know that they've had law of war training because they're given sort of specific rules to follow in carrying out armed conflict, often in the form of pocket cards, which reflect a combination of rules from the law of war as well as policy judgments uh, that the United States military hierarchy and civilian leadership has made in terms of how they want a particular conflict covered. So, uh, you know, it's not necessary to, to be able to poll an individual service person and say, have you had training in the law of war um, for there to, in fact, be law of war compliance. But I don't know yeah, what the CIA yeah, is. Mr. Anderson. Doing. just disagree a little bit with that. Mr. Foster, I think your question is very well put because uh, the interviews I've done with drone operators, they have the final say about whether they press the button. So even if it's been cleared by Chairman Panetta, and the last I believed, I don't think he's been trained in the law of armed conflict. But at any rate, the drone operators are the ones who finally have the responsibility of pushing the button. So their training is highly relevant. If they're going after a named individual and he's in a house with a number of other persons who we have no information about so that they, we have to err on the side that they are civilians, our fighting men and women know the rules of proportionality and they're not gonna make that strike. The CIA person, that pr name on the list is his sign that he's accomplished what he's been set out to do. And that's a very different calculation for the strike. Okay, I guess um, my next question has to do with probably my um, ignorance of the exact definition of the battlefield. If you just look at the supply chain, if you consider, you know, for example, an IED used in Pakistan that's manufactured in Iran, say, and that may have go through staging areas in Pakistan and have and be shipped on, on in, by means that we can identify along the way. Um, how far back in the supply chain um, can we can you go before you leave the battlefield? Can I just uh, interject? My apologies, Mr. Foster. Uh, we're having some difficulty with the microphones. If I could ask each of the witnesses to pull them closer to them and make sure they're on where they speak, it'll help with the recording uh, of the hearing. So thank you. I'm sorry, again, Mr. Foster. That's right, Mr. Glazer. Well, I, again, I, I respectfully disagree with Professor O'Connell that the law of war provides a definition of the term battlefield. The law of war provides a definition of military object. Um, and a military object is something that by its purpose or use 
uh, creates a military advantage. An IED, therefore, is clearly a military object. The issue then about how far back uh, in the logistics chain um, that we can attack it, I think then becomes a matter governed by sort of, of broader rules of, of law because we are not an, in an armed conflict with Iran. And there's nothing that makes it a crime for a nation to engage in the production of war materials and sell them to other countries. In fact, even during World War II, uh, Switzerland provided war materials to other countries. Um, and that was not a violation of any law. Switzerland was a neutral power and was not a legitimate object of attack. Uh, so where the IED becomes a legitimate or lawful object of attack um, becomes where it either comes into the hands of terrorists in a, in a country or location where it's, it's legal to attack them, or arguably where it comes into their possession in a neutral country, and that neutral country is allowing its territory to be used by that group to the detriment of the country that's at war. So if we are in a war with al-Qaeda, if when al-Qaeda comes into possession of a weapon, uh, and if it is in a country which is not taking steps to prevent them from using their territory to our detriment, that I think is where we draw the line and where an attack becomes lawful. I, I have a different view of the matter. Um, first, I think it's important that the law, the current law, is what we have in our minds. So 1949 is the Geneva Conventions, 1945 is the United Nations Charter. These are the dates um, that we should be working from. There's been a lot of confusion about the right to use drones in Pakistan because of events in Pakistan having an impact on our battles in Afghanistan. And I think this is where some people who even understand that there's no such thing as a worldwide war against terrorists do have some confusion about why we aren't in a war in Pakistan as well as Afghanistan. But that sovereign boundary between Pakistan and Afghanistan is highly significant. It's highly significant for our efforts to help support a stable and effective Pakistan, which is ultimately going to be our protection from terrorism and lawlessness in Pakistan. And that, respecting that border is essential. Yes, there is some cross-border activity. There are people hiding. There are some munitions going across the border. But international law, a series of cases from the International Court of Justice, makes it clear in that situation, Afghanistan, with our help, has to protect from that kind of low-level activity at the border. It can't make strikes into Pakistan against those kinds of activities. That is, uh, that's clearly unlawful. And, and I would just use an analogy. Think about the way the United States would feel we have a lot of lawlessness on our border with Mexico. Mexico is justifiably unhappy that we're not able to restrain um, narco terrorists from getting across the border, bringing weapons in, bringing persons back and forth. And they have made complaints to us and they have told us to stop these criminals from getting across the border. Should we allow their um, uh, police to use or their military to use combat drones to strike at hotels or places in Arizona where we, where the Mexican military thinks that some of these people are hiding? Absolutely not. We will, if, if Mexico asks us, and of course we are making an effort, as Pakistan is, and we will help um, Mexico even more, but we expect Mexico to do the main job of defense at their border. And that's what we have to expect Afghanistan to do too. Okay, I just, thank I, you, Mike. One sorry. thing that I, I missed, omitted from my statement, um, is that there is, though, an imminence requirement for a strike in a neutral territory. So in other words, where I said that, that we could potentially strike at an IED in the possession of al-Qaeda in a neutral territory, uh, there does also, though, have to be a, an imminent nature to the threat. So if it was simply in a warehouse or being stockpiled or wasn't going to be used against us in the near term, uh, then we don't have, have a right to strike in neutral territory. But I do think that, that the, the right is perhaps a little bit more extensive uh, than Professor O'Connell presents it. Thank you. Mr. Duncan, you're recognized for five minutes or thereabouts. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think I need five minutes, but my, um, I do have some concerns about this. I certainly have no uh, sympathy for any uh, terrorist or anybody who is attempting to uh, kill Americans, but I do have some concerns when I read in the, uh, as I do in the uh, committee briefing, that the number of um, drones has been increased in the Defense Department from um, 167 in 2002 to over 6,000 today. Uh, 
or, or I guess it says in 2008, maybe, maybe there's more than 6,000 now, and I, unfortunately I couldn't come and hear uh, your testimony, but um, uh, a few months ago I read an interview in the Washington Times which said uh, where the, um, uh, the top uh, United Nations anti-terrorism official said that uh, Al-Qaeda now had so, uh, so few members that it was, uh, quote, uh, having trouble maintaining credibility. Those were his words. And uh, I remember reading an earlier column by the conservative columnist Walter Williams who said that uh, the threats uh, from al-Qaeda al had been so exaggerated that uh, al-Qaeda had, uh, uh, I think, fewer than 3,000 members at that time, and this was uh, two or three years ago, I guess, uh, and had no money and was uh, made up mainly of high school dropouts who were, were living at home with their parents. And I saw another uh, report after that that said it had fewer than 1,700 members, and of course all that was uh, well before these, uh, this interview by this uh, United Nations official. And what I'm concerned about, I've, I've long thought, I mean, we've been in Afghanistan nine years and um, in Iraq, and I've long thought that, uh, uh, that the threat uh, uh, that's there has been greatly exaggerated and I'm afraid that uh, m much of this is being done because of um, money and power. And uh, when I see us increasing the number of these drones to many thousands, I'm, I'm very concerned that we're going to start seeing more uh, instances of, um, of innocent civilians being killed uh, or mistakes being made. And um, that's the... Uh, that's the concern that I have um, um, more than anything else. And I just thought I'd add that to the hearing here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Welch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you. My first uh, observation is every time I listen to Mr. Duncan, it makes more and more sense. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here. Just a few questions. In the last month, there have been several news reports, of course, uh, you've referred to this, I think, that American citizen has been act, uh, added to the target list. Uh, just go down the line quickly, if you can. I don't have much time. But can the U.S., in your opinion, legally target an American citizen? Uh, yes. And it's as they've done, and the information that's been released on the basis that we know publicly, at least on the basis of which he's targeted, and the emphasis on the uh, the statements by the administration that this had gone from simply making statements about various things to active um, uh, assistance in planning and operations. An American citizen who takes up weapons um, against his country and fights our combatants on the battlefield, of course, may be killed in the course of that armed conflict. Otherwise, that American citizen, as any person in the world, should be um, detained through law enforcement measures. If that person resists arrest, of course, a very dangerous person um, may be killed in the course of resisting arrest, the fleeing felon rule. Otherwise, we all have human rights, Mr. Welch. Thank you. Uh, I'll limit my answer to a strict law of war perspective. If the individual is affiliated with a legitimate adversary and has essentially the status of a combatant or an individual in the chain of command of the combatant, then I believe they're a lawful target. And in fact, under domestic law, I mean, the, the Supreme Court held an ex parte Kieran that it didn't matter whether a combatant might have a claim to U.S. citizenship. It was the fact of affiliation with the adversary that made them liable to targeting. Yeah, thank you. I, I believe the answer is yes as well, and I would remind us that the part of the authority here includes domestic law as well. President's constitutional authorities and uh, the law that you enacted in 2001, the authorization for the use of military force, may permit targeting that individual. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to ask you about this. Last year, the International Committee of the Red Cross put out interpretive guidance, as you know, to help define what, be, what can be considered, quote, direct participation in hostilities. And again, I'd like you to just go down the line. I'm sure you all are familiar with that. Do you agree with the ICRC's interpretation uh, of the relevant law? If you don't, what would you change? 
Most of what's in the interpretive guidance is fine, but there is a number of provisions in there that I think are completely uh, over the edge, in fact, and I'm very surprised that the ICRC would put them out given the fact that they could not command the majority of their own experts in that regard. Those primarily go to the question of part-time combatancy or civilians who take some part in hostilities and the question of where you draw those lines, but I think that the way that the ICRC has drawn them is really quite unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> I've, spent a, uh, I've spent a very good deal of time studying the uh, interpretive guidance. Um, in fact, I, I believe Professor Anderson is not quite right. There were a few um, of the experts who have a dissenting opinion but not a majority. The few who had a dissenting opinion were from countries where they wanted to have an expansive right to use military force and some of the, uh, the friendly countries to those. And the unhappiness in the final product was that the ICRC, I think, did, in fact, take a step away from the strict uh, definition of who is a direct participant in hostilities um, to appease these uh, experts. But at the same time, it said, if we're going to do that, we've got to add some other protections back in. And so it actually raised the requirement of necessity for any killing. Mm -hmm. I think, on balance, taken together, those two uh, elements, a looser definition of who is a potential target, but a higher and more restrictive right of when you may actually kill is a balanced outcome in the end. If you're going to change mm -hmm. the law, I think that's the only way you could do it. I think by now, because the ICRC is so influential, this is now becoming the standard. I think in the end we're going to be happy with it, but it's, it's certainly been a difficult um, development process. Thank you. Thank you. Two quick comments. Uh, the first is that the, the higher standard may very well be a good idea, but I don't think it's reflective of the, the, the state of which nation states are, are in, and nation states ultimately make the international law. Um, so I'm, I, I certainly think aspirationally it's probably good, but I think it exceeds the current state of the law. The other thing I would, I would just point out, as I'm sure you're aware, but, but for the record, is that uh, the ICRC guidance only really comes into play if we're, we're categorizing the adversary as civilians because it relates to direct participation of civilians. If an individual is in fact a warrior or is treated as a combatant, then under the current law of war, that status makes them targetable at all times and essentially all places. Um, so it's only if we're choosing to deny the adversary combatant status, which I think is a political choice that we have, mm -hmm. um, we can then in invoke a whole different set of rules. I'd also Thank make you. two comments. I think there are Thank problems you. with the part-time warriors. I think the ICRC interpretation doesn't reflect the, the nuance that needs to be taken into account to uh, get at insurgents <coughs> and terrorists who go home at the end of the day. Uh, as Professor Glazier would say, a, an armed uh, member of our armed forces, of course, knows, enjoys no such uh, privilege to, uh, to go home and watch television at the end of the day. He's, he's target 24-7. <coughs> Second comment, is, of course, is that this, as I've said, uh, before today, this paradigm of the laws of armed conflict is only one of the spheres of authority that must be taken into account in right. deciding who may be reached as a target. Right. Thank you. Could, could I just back. add briefly that, in fact, the um, interpretive guidance understands the point Professor Glazier was making that it would be unfair to regular combatants if they were held to, if they didn't have the same necessity protection that um, direct <coughs> participants have. Um, non-traditional or unlawful combatants, and so they've actually re uh, added the necessity requirement even to regular combatants. <coughs> and I think it's only fair that, that our um, serving men and women in uniform get as much protection as somebody who's an unlawful combatant or a direct participant in hostilities without the right to do so. Um, so I think that's probably in the end we would all agree is a good thing. Um, and I think it also goes to the point that I've been trying to make that the world does not accept everywhere you go is a battlefield be because of the person who's there. I internationally, we're coming to this understanding that killing really should be in situations of necessity, and, and that's not all of these places everywhere in the world. It's certainly not here in the United States, Germany, England, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your questions on that. Mr. Quigley. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the panel, uh, Mr. Bynum from Georgetown University uh, talking about the need for greater oversight. His quote was, um, 
You need someone to effectively act as a devil's advocate within the system who is ideally outside the decision loop of such programs. It could be a U.S. attorney or something like the Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act Court that makes judgments on secret wiretaps. Because the simple requirement of going before a judge or an independent official to make a case for a targeted killing introduces a measure of accountability. So what I would ask the panel is, do you agree with Mr. Bynum? Should there be such a, uh, some sort of independent third party to oversee and approve drone activities? I would disagree strenuously with the proposition that this is an area that should be judicialized. Uh, I think that it's not the proper frame for the United States judiciary, and I don't think that they would have any either expertise and inevitably would wind up turning it into something that would both make the um, intelligence and military uses of force less effective, and at the same time I believe it would also corrupt the domestic uh, judicial process in the United States because they would be involved in a series of activities with necessarily very murky lines to be drawn. I don't think that it's an appropriate role for the, for the judiciary to be involved in. I do think that there is a much greater role to be had for accountability and oversight coming from the Congress itself. Precisely as the prospect of drones um, raises the possibility of smaller and more discrete uses of force, in which case that can in some sense substitute for war. And in that regard, I think that the right accountability mechanism actually rests with the Congress and not with any other body. But what's, who's the person that does that on the battlefield? Um, I think that the questions about the use of force that are most crucial here are ones that are actually being made by the CIA and that, that requires that the processes that Professor Banks had referred to, I think that they actually need to be strengthened to require um, more consultation with Congress and more information to be given to Congress. And I think that one of the important roles that Congress has in this is to be able to raise objections to uh, particular <laughs> things. Uh, I think that it's a much more complicated role for Congress, but I believe that it is actually the right mechanism to provide accountability. I agree with Professor Anderson. Um, having a court involved would not help us get into compliance with the law of armed conflict. There's an assumption in the idea that somehow what the CIA is doing just needs some oversight. In fact, there's no justifying it, so how could a court help? I agree with uh, Professor Anderson that it's up to Congress to make sure that the executive branch remains in compliance with our fundamental obligations internationally to the extent that it's not, the executive's not doing it itself. I would just say that I if the attacks or those attacks which are being conducted under the law of war, under military authority, then these issues are essentially addressed through the rules of engagement as far as deciding what level of oversight is necessary within the military chain of command. Uh, if this is activity that we're deciding is taking place deliberately outside of the, the law of war setting uh, and we are using basically national security laws and um, international rights or asserted rights to self-defense, then that does seem to me that that is a matter for, for Congress to decide how they want to structure the law governing those matters. I agree that the court should not be involved and I also share the view that Congress could do more than it, than it has uh, customarily. We, we've talked today uh, some about battlefield, and, and it may be that in terms of uh, oversight, one thing that Congress could consider is establishing criteria for the use of targeting outside of traditional battlefields. In other words, you need something to oversee. You, you, need, you need more than what the law now says to be currently and fully informed. Your Bynum quote suggests that there should be some measure that could judge whether or not the efficacious behavior of our, of our government is, uh, has followed its, its uh, policies. Could there be criteria for the use of force outside the traditional battlefield? Could those be statutorily uh, conferred? Could they be then subject to oversight of the, of the type that we've been discussing here? And, what's so. the and what would the precedent for that be? The, it, the precedent might be, as, uh, as Bynum suggested in his comment, the use of an intelligence court to review uh, the surveillance requests of the Department of Justice, even though that's a judicial forum. Uh, I, I think for all the reasons that have been offered here today, the courts are ill-equipped to be involved in that process. They, would, they, would, uh, they wouldn't want to do it. Uh, the FISA court, I think, has a very full plate. <laughs>
and uh, and yeah, and you are much more equipped, I think, to make those kinds of judgments in your role. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm going to make some statements, I, I guess, and ask you to sort of react if you disagree with them and, and move along with that. If, if we have a situation where we have a battlefield like Afghanistan, the military is using drones, I don't think I've heard any of you disagree with that. Uh, I think all of you think that there's a question whether the CIA or other civilian organization can do that with authority. If we take one of the people involved in that conflict, uh, Al-Qaeda, some Al-Qaeda operative, and say he moves back over the border into Pakistan. Uh, some of you think that, that it's fine for the military to go after him there. Uh, some of you think that, it, again, there's a question problem with the civilians or the CIA doing it. Is there a problem, and that's particularly true, I guess, if you think that the uh, Pakistanis have agreed to have the United States exercise this type of uh, force. Am I right there? So if this Al-Qaeda person goes over the border and Pakistan says, oh, yeah, we're fighting that fight, too, and you can use your drones to get them, then, and then nobody on the panel seems to have difficulty there. If that individual keeps traveling and goes to Yemen, uh, I sense that some of you don't have a problem with the military going after them there. Okay? So there's one individual going to Yemen, targeted, and, and nobody has a problem with that, the military going after them, even though they may not be involved at that particular time in anything imminent. Okay, I'll, yeah, jump. That's what I was thinking. So we're, I'm just going to keep moving this unless somebody jumps in on me no, here. No, yeah, um, Chairman, um, when you said there's only one person, it, it makes it sound as if it's a majority vote and we're the Supreme Court and we get to decide whether killing that person in, in Yemen is lawful or not. Um, I am speaking, I'm really trying to be, this is not my personal opinion. No, no, it's the law. I want you this to interpret the law. This is what international form. law yeah. says, and the authorities that I'm speaking of are the United Nations rapporteur well, and I think we all feeling. understand it. I, right. Nobody's so, wanting to pin this so on you. We're asking you as professors and legal scholars to right. tell us what the, what the, right. la the so, law of the land is so out I, there. I want to stand here as, uh, with many, many others who agree with me, even though the three who have been called today don't uh, share that view. Okay. Well, I, I would like to speak for myself, I think, sure. rather than have someone else decide what my views are on this. Um, and now's your chance. Now, exactly, sir. <laughs> um, the international law that, that governs the use of force preemptively in other countries was basically crafted by the United States uh, in discussion with the United Kingdom after the Carolyn incident of 1837. And it does, you know, I, I may have sort of seemed a little bellicose in some of my earlier remarks, but it does, in fact, impose constraints of necessity and imminence. And so I do think that this one individual, as you've described, you know, while they have moved across the border in Pakistan, they may still reflect that imminent threat. Um, but unless we actually had intelligence that said not only are they in Yemen, but they're in the verge of doing imminent harm to the United States from that position in Yemen, then in fact under the rules that the U.S. has taken the lead in crafting, that's too far removed and we would no longer have the authority even with the, for the military to use, use force at that point. Uh, well, if we take, uh, go ahead Mr. Anderson. Round it out, I guess. Um, I, I think one of the things we have to keep very much in mind here is that the United States has long had a policy um, and has declared it as its legal view and it's reiterated in Harold Coe's statement as the considered view that where a country is unable or unwilling to prevent its territory from being used as safe haven for transnational terrorists, and this goes back decades and decades and decades, the U.S. view is that, yes, there are imminence requirements, and yes, there are Caroline requirements, and yes, there's numbers of other um, considerations, but important as sovereignty and territorial integrity are, the United States regards it as lawful um, to be able to go and strike those persons where a, t a country is unable or unwilling to control its territory. So an individual like al um, if somebody were to take it and go after him, are they using the uh, the combatant theory or the self-defense theory? I believe that the administration is using the self-defense theory at this point um, because of where he is located and because I'm not sh uh, actually I can't tell you that and I wish I knew and I think it would be something where Congress should actually ask questions of the administration to find because that my, out. My I don't concern know. there is if Alaki goes back to Texas is it then lawful to blow him up there? No. The Territorial United States is a very, very different proposition from Yemen or any other place. Okay. For the practical reason that an, an arrest may be effected there. 
uh, then that presumes that arrest couldn't be affected in some other country where it does. Is. If that alternative is available, we should pursue it. Is that generally agreed by you, Mr. Anderson, as well? No, not entirely. I, I believe that as Harold Coe stated in his testimony, there is not an obligation to give process and there is not an obligation to give warning once one has identified that person as being either um, a target in relation to an armed conflict or self-defense. And there's no obligation to arrest them if that's possible, even if there you could. There is no obligation to arrest right them if that's, and now there is an obligation to identify him as, as a target and to show that there's some necessity about that. And the question of how much necessity may involve and probably should involve a question of is this London and could we go to the authorities there in order to do that. But the reality is that Yemen and Britain are really different. And we Where does this, the eminence of the threat come in on this? I know Mr. Koh spoke about that. Uh, and I think getting some definition that of that would the, be helpful. Uh, he raises that as one of the considerations that has to be taken into account as part of self-defense. And so he's referring to what has been referred to as the Caroline Doctrine. But the United States has embraced for a very long time the idea that, that self-defense includes a, quote, active self-defense where one is looking to the character of the threat and things that they have done in the past and things that the group with which an individual is affiliated has done in the past in order to decide that they constitute a threat. It is not some idea in the United States' mind, certainly, that it is looking and saying, oh, they're about to cross the border with the nuclear weapon. It's not that kind of imminence. I don't know what policy we've had for a very long time on this. The uh, targeted killing of individuals. Could you pull it a little closer? Uh, I'm sorry. Thank the targeted you. killing of individuals has really begun after 9/11. Uh, we we didn't take this view that we could go around uh, with drones or uh, and killing people of uh, this kind. And I think the comment that there's somehow a distinction between what we can do in the U.S. and the U.K. versus Yemen is really the telling point. If there's a worldwide armed conflict that we're justified in fighting out of self-defense and treating all the persons involved in it in al-Qaeda as combatants who we can kill without warning, then why isn't there an armed conflict in the United States where we can do the same thing, or the United Kingdom, or Germany? In fact, the Bush administration took the view that we could do this. There were statements made to the Congress that we could, and that just shows what, that this is a fiction we're dealing with, created by lawyers, and it is not the reality and not what the law requires. There's no armed conflict happening in this country, and our official view of Yemen and Pakistan is that those countries, we should be working with their authorities.